Let's take our Bibles this morning. I want you to turn to the book of Romans, chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, we're going to look at several scriptures in the book of Romans, and then we'll also be looking at a passage in the book of John, and I'll be adding several other scriptures. Today, our subject is this, what does a person have to do to get saved? How does a person receive the forgiveness of their sins? It's very important for us to understand salvation because... Salvation is the beginning point of all things. Everything starts there. Anything that would flow out of our life spiritually has to start with salvation. And so today as we go through our message, I want to encourage you to do two things. Because see, if you're not careful, some already here could have almost already shut me off. Salvation, I know about that. I mean, good grief. That's the first thing you do, you know, and say, I know all about that. And if you're not careful... You'll, you'll, you'll do that, and that wouldn't be a good decision to make. I want to encourage you to listen very, very carefully. The first reason is this. Because as I go through the scriptures and share with you what a person must do to have biblical salvation, that's the kind of salvation you want, right? You don't want, do you want Baptist salvation? I don't really care about Baptist salvation. Or Lutheran or Methodist or Pentecostal or any. I, I want Bible salvation. That's the kind of salvation that I want, the kind that God gives. And so we're going to go through the Bible today. And I want you to think about, if you're here and you've never made a decision to receive Christ as your Savior, then you're going to hear the information that you need, maybe for the first time. And we pray that you would be saved today. But if you're here and you're thinking, no, I've already done that, then what I want you to do is I want you to go back to that time Oh, I don't remember the time, Brother Scott. Now, I'm not saying you would know the date and the hour and all that. But you ought to remember it. I, I, don't, I don't remember being saved, Brother Scott. I just always was. No, it doesn't work that way. Getting saved is an event. It's a moment. It, it happens to you when you understand the truth and respond to it. And so go back to that time that you would say, yeah, right there. That's when I got saved. And then I want you, as we go through the scriptures, to ask, did I do what the Bible says I have to do to be saved? Because you see, it is possible to think that you're saved and not be saved. That is absolutely possible. Why would that happen? Well, a lot of times it happens because people make a decision for Christ when they're very young. And because they're very young, and, and maybe especially if they grew up in church or had someone faithfully take from the church, they early on begin to think about those principles and those processes and they hear teachers and pastors say you need to be saved, you need to be saved, they're hearing all these things and so they want to respond and they do respond but in all reality they don't completely understand what they're doing. And most kids in that case, if they stay in church, later on they realize, oh, I, I, you know, I, it's not that they did anything wrong, it's not that they weren't trying to do the right thing, they just weren't old enough to understand. And that's not a certain age. It's different with every person. But sometimes that happens. They just, if they look back there, they say, hmm, you know, I don't think I really did understand. And another thing that could happen to a person that would bring this about is that whoever led them to Christ, whoever told them about salvation, what if they told them the wrong things? What if they told them something different than what the Bible says? And the person out of a pure heart responded. They wanted to do the right thing. They wanted to honor God. But they had bad information. And that can happen. Listen, there's a lot of churches out here that if you go in and ask them, what do you believe about salvation? How does a person get the forgiveness of their sins? How does a person know for sure they're going to heaven? And it, you get an explanation from them. And then you hold it up against the Bible. It's not the same thing the Bible says. And so there's a lot of people like that that made a decision. They out of religious faithfulness or even out of heritage. I know people that it's kind of a, a heritage for them. They're not really faithful, but it's their heritage. And so they made a decision, but the problem was they didn't have the right information. And so it wasn't true biblical salvation. I met others who made a decision because they were pressured to do so. Maybe the preacher, maybe mom and dad, maybe grandma and grandpa, maybe a friend of theirs kind of pushed them towards that. And finally, it was kind of like, well, okay, if it'll get them off my back, or if it'll make them happy, I'll do it. But the problem is, it wasn't their decision. It wasn't a, a genuine decision. 
I've seen people do it to try to experience that if you just walked up to them and said, are you saved? They'd say yes. But I like to ask people, if they tell me yes, I like to say to them, tell me about it. Share your experience with me. I'd like to hear about when you got saved. And that way, as they share their salvation experience, I begin to get an idea of, did they really do what the Bible says you have to do, or was it you know, somehow not accurate? And so I want you to do that. Think about your salvation experience, compare it to what we're going to see in the Bible today, and make sure that that's what you did to receive Christ as your Savior. Then secondly, I want you to listen very carefully, because I would want every one of us who truly are believers to be able to share this with someone else. Now, I'm going to give you more detail today than you probably need to just share your faith with somebody. But these general points that we're going to go through, we ought to be able, all of us who know Christ as our Savior, we ought to be able to share this with somebody else. If we can't, that's okay. But staying that way is not okay. Mm -hmm. Scott, right now, I don't think I could do that. Okay, that's all right. That's not a problem. But... Do you love lost people that are dying and going to hell enough to learn how to do it? Because we need to be able to do that. We need to be willing to do that. So those are the two things that I want you to do. Now, God did not leave us without a clear answer to this question, how does a person get saved? God did not make that confusing. Of all the things that the Bible teaches, salvation is the most fundamental and clear. We can get a great understandable answer to that question and it's such a tragedy that many people have made it complicated because it truly is not complicated. Here's the thing the person needs to understand and accept in order to be saved. Number one, I am a sinner. That's the first thing a person has to do. So you're going back, you're thinking about when you got saved. Did I understand that? Did I, did I really accept that concept that I'm a sinner? But that's the very first thing that you have to accept is, I'm a sinner. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're there in Romans, you can look at uh, chapter 3 and verse 23. Uh, the verse is on the screen, and you can get lazy and not turn in your Bible. But I think it would be good for you to know where that's at in your Bible, so that if you're using your Bible to help someone else, you, you've got you know, the concept there. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All, A double L, no exceptions, every single body has sinned and come short of the glory of God. God has a standard, it's perfection, no body measures up. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, sin was initiated in the Garden of Eden. You can go back, in fact, recently in our grace readings, we read this in chapter 3 of Genesis that. Adam and Eve were there in the garden, and God had given them commandments and different things that they were supposed to follow and do. And one very specific commandment was, do not eat of that tree that's in the midst of the garden. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat of that tree. And they did. And if you're looking for a definition or understanding of what sin is, sin is any disobedience to God. That's what sin is. So anything God said, don't do that, and we do it anyway, that's sin. Anything God said, I want you to do this, but we fail to do it, that's sin. And so any disobedience to God is sin, and that's exactly what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden, and they plunged right into sin. But see, it wasn't just them that was affected. Since that time, every single human being that's born of an earthly father has this effect of that choice they made all the way back in the Garden of Eden Sin is now something that we are born with. But Mike, you and I did not commit our first sin and then become a sinner. We were sinners. That's why we committed our first sin. We don't go down the road and say, huh, see that animal there, I wonder what it is. I can't really quite make it out. Woof! Poof! It's a dog. No. Dogs don't become dogs when they bark. Dogs bark because they are dogs, and ducks swim because they are swim they are ducks. And it's their nature, right? And it's our nature to sin. That's that's unfortunately something that was implanted in us. In fact, David talked about that in Psalm 51 when he said, "Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me." Now, David wasn't saying that the way he was conceived was of a sinful act. That's not what he was saying. 
that even in conception, that sin nature already existed in him. And that's true of you and me, of all people. We are sinners by nature. But here's the problem. We can't fix it. We can't make it right. We in and of ourselves are powerless to conquer that problem and make it right. Isaiah said this, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. The very best that you and I have to offer God. Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You can't come before God. I can't come before God and say, yeah, God, but I was a preacher for you. That won't get me into heaven. Yeah, God, but I went to church most of the time. That won't get me into heaven. Yeah, God, but I got baptized back there. Remember that? That won't get me into heaven. Yeah, God, but I helped all kinds of little old ladies across the street. And in general, I was a good guy. That will not get me into heaven because all my righteousnesses, the very best I could come up with and possibly offer to God, is filthy rags. My iniquities have carried me away. The reality of our sinfulness should hit us hard. And it shouldn't be just a flippant, Oh yeah, nobody's perfect. Shouldn't be that kind of thing. It should be something that produces sorrow in us. The, the Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 7, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. It causes somebody to repent, and then that brings about salvation. So this understanding that we're a sinner, it shouldn't just be admitting a difficult situation. It should be regretting the problem that we have. I have sinned and failed God, and I regret it. That's the first step of being saved. The second step is this, that I must understand that there is a price or a penalty for my sin. I don't get to be the sinner and then God just pat me on the head and say, that's okay, you couldn't do any better, you know, it's all right. No, there is actually a penalty for sin. There's a price that has to be paid. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. Somebody has got to pay for our sins. Somebody's going to pay for our sins. The wages of sin is death. The, the rest of that verse is really good news, isn't it? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how we receive that eternal life. That's the gift of God. But in order for us to have that gift, somebody has got to pay the price for our sin. And that death that's the payment for sin... That's not just talking about physical death. All of us are going to face that sooner or later. It's talking about spiritual death. That's the true and real price for our sins is that kind of death. In fact, think about this. People who are born once die twice. But people who are born twice can only die once. Let's say it again. People who are born once die twice. But people who have been born twice can only die once. Sounds like a riddle, but it's really not. The Bible is very clear that each and every one of us has an appointment with death. It says in Hebrews 9.27, And it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Every single person in here has an appointment with death. And it's a weird appointment because you don't know when it is. You know, it's, it's out there somewhere, but I don't know exactly when that appointment is. But the thing of it is that after my appointment with death has been kept, then judgment comes. And so that's not, it's not I die and that's it and it's all over. No. Then judgment 
is coming. That's the physical death, but then there's also a spiritual death. The Bible says in Revelation 21 and verse 8 that all unbelievers will have their part in the lake of fire, which is the second death. So physical death is the first one. Spiritual death in the lake of fire is the second one, and it's where all unbelievers will go. There's not, there's, there's just two options, believe and be rescued from it, or refuse to believe and perish in hell forever and ever and ever. Those are the only two options, and people who are only born once, a physical birth, will face both of those deaths, physical and eternal spiritual death. But people who have born, been born twice can only face physical death. I want you to keep your place in Romans, but turn over to John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, you will find Jesus interacting with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews. He was a spiritual ruler. And in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, it says this. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Pretty straightforward, huh? Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can I enter the second time into my mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily I say unto you, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So, Jesus comes to Nicodemus, or Nicodemus rather comes to Jesus, and um, I don't know if he's buttering him up or just being complimentary, but he says, you know, we know you're from God. There's no way people could do what you're doing unless they were from God. And he gives him all these compliments, and Jesus doesn't even say thank you. He says, uh, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, huh, born again? How am I going to pull up? How can I get back inside my mother's womb and be born a second time? And Jesus said, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a physical birth and a spiritual birth. Being born again is being born of the Spirit, being born from above. And so he said to Nicodemus, listen, you need to be born both of the water and of the Spirit. Don't make that water baptism. That's a terrible mistake. Every time you see water in the Bible, it doesn't mean baptism. Nicodemus, and here's how you know. Context, right, Gideon? Context will always tell you what the Bible is saying. And the context of that verse, the very next verse says, what's born of the flesh is flesh, and what's born of the spirit is spirit. He's contrasting two verses. And Nicodemus, and you and me, and everybody else, when we were born, the mother's water broke, and we were born a physical birth. But Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, if you want to see the kingdom of God, that was not enough. You need to be born again. And the second birth is the birth of the Spirit, to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And those who have been born twice can only die once. The physical birth, the physical death might get us. And Brother Tim, I'm hoping that I get raptured out of here. So I'm hoping that I avoid death altogether, completely. I'm hoping I get my way around that. But even if I should die physically, only that physical death can touch me. The spiritual death cannot touch me. The Bible says of those that believe in John chapter 5 and verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life Amen. and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. When I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior, I pass from death unto life. Eric, it, it, it's just not on the table anymore. Hell is out of the picture. I do not have to worry for a second about spending eternity in hell because Jesus Christ has saved me, rescued me, forgiven me of my sin, given me eternal life. I cannot die spiritually. It's impossible.
impossible. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. If a man believes in me, he shall not die. And that's exactly what I have inside of me. And I hope that it's what you have inside of you as well. So, biblical salvation. First, when I said I got saved, whenever that was, did I know that I was a sinner? Had I really come to grips with that? Secondly, did I accept the idea that there is a penalty for that? Somebody's got to pay. Someone's got to pay. Me or Jesus, somebody has got to pay. Thirdly, realize that Jesus was willing to pay your debt. He was willing to do that for you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 that God commendeth his love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That terrible, sinful condition that you and I found ourselves in, God knew it about us, and He loved us so much that He sent Jesus to die for us. He commended His love towards us. Some modern versions say demonstrated or showed, and that's not bad, but it's a little bit short, actually, of the meaning there. God put His love on display compared to anything else that we could receive. And he said, look, this is how much I love you. I sent Jesus to die for you, even when you were a sinner, even when you were undeserving. And now, you can have everlasting life by putting your faith and trust in me. He literally became our substitute. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, that he knew, who knew no sin, Jesus, was made sin for us. How come? That we, through him, might be made the righteousness of God. Remember? Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's why those won't do us any good. We need the righteousnesses of Jesus imputed into our life and into our heart. He became sin for us, that we might become righteous through him. Jesus was willing to pay the price. No one forced Jesus to pay the price. Mm -hmm. He did it because he loved us. John 10 says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Jesus said, Hey, this is all my decision." Nobody's forcing me. Nobody's making me. I'm doing it because of my love. And I have the power to do it. I can lay it down and I can take it back up. And when they buried him in, in the tomb on the third day, he proved that he meant exactly what he said. So, biblical salvation. I must realize that I'm a sinner. I must realize there's a price for that sin. And I must realize that Jesus was willing to pay that price. And finally, I must realize that God requires me to believe. God requires me to believe. There is something on our part to be done. And the something on our part to be done is to believe. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That believing in him, that's the key to being saved. That's the key to avoiding perishing in hell. That's the key to receiving Christ as your Savior. Now here's a critical moment. Because if you and I were to go about and ask people, do you believe in Jesus? The vast majority of us would, would say yes. And in fact, if we said to people, do you believe in God? Even still, even in the world we live in today, many, many people would say yes. But what do they mean by they believe in God? They believe in Jesus. Do they mean they've had a true salvation experience? Or do they mean that they just accept his existence? You see, because it's possible for a person to intellectually accept all the facts. Everything I've just said to you, it's possible 
to accept all of that as fact. Yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, somebody's got to die to pay for those sins. And yes, Jesus was willing to do it for me. It's possible to get that far and still come up short. Mm -hmm. If you're confused about what it means to believe, and remember I'm asking you to go back to that moment that you would claim as your salvation experience, and I want you to ask yourself, did I really believe? The Greek word is pistos. It means... To trust or to put your confidence in Jesus. That's how a person gets saved. Mm -hmm. Not just up in my head, I accept the facts. But from my heart, within, my soul, my spirit, I put my trust in Him. I believe that what Jesus did for me and that alone is sufficient for my sins to be forgiven. Mm -hmm. And I put all my confidence in Him. All my eggs in that basket to go back to a very old, start to show my age a little bit, a very old saying. I just, you just, you know, yeah. want a more modern one? Push all your chips in. That's a more modern one, okay? Oh my. Well, I didn't like that one. I don't really either. But <laughs> I'm trusting him and nothing else. That's, I don't, I don't see another way. I don't see another possibility. Only Jesus and what he did for me. When I'm witnessing the children, sometimes I'll tell them to think about maybe going swimming with their parents. And I ask them, did they ever have a time where the parent was in the pool or the lake or whatever, and they were up on the edge, and they would say, you know, jump in, I'll catch you, jump in, I'll catch you. Okay? Now when the child is standing up on the dock, they can say all day long, I believe you'll catch me. Oh yeah, I know daddy will catch me. I know mommy will catch me. Oh yeah. That's not faith. Mm -hmm. That's stating a belief fact. I believe if I jump in, they will catch me. Faith is when you jump. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's believing. That's pistos. That's putting your trust in him. Yes, I believe Jesus will save me and forgive me and cleanse me of all my sins. And I'm completely putting my trust in that. I'm jumping in. I'm believing that He's the one that will rescue me. And there's a long list of scripture up here on this screen. And it's just a sampling of all the passages that say, if you believe, if you believe, if you believe. If you put your trust in Christ, if you put your confidence in Him and what He did. And then finally, this faith. According to the Bible, not according to Brother Scott, not according to a religious system, according to the Bible, this faith is expressed by calling out to God. That's how that faith is expressed. It says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So when you come to the point of realizing, I am a sinner, I failed God and I regret that, and a penalty's got to be paid. A price is there to be met. And I don't have what it takes to meet it. Only Jesus and what he did is sufficient. Only Jesus can pay that price for my sins. And that's exactly what he did when he died on the cross. When he was buried. When he rose again the third day. And I want that salvation. I, I want to be forgiven. I want to be rescued. God, save me. It doesn't have to be those exact words. When I got saved, I said, Lord, I don't want to go to hell. Come into my heart and save me. That was my exact prayer. I've listened to hundreds of people pray prayers for salvation. Hundreds. And some of them were shorter than my prayer. And some of them were a mile long. It's not the words. Are you really from your heart putting your trust in Jesus? That's the issue. In fact, a lot of times when we have an invitation at the end of the service, a lot of times I think that 
when a person just steps out and starts coming forward that they're saved. If they heard the message and they knew that's what they needed to do, yeah, when they get up there, they'll, they'll pray and, and, and everything, but really stepping out was saying, yes, this is what I want. And in essence, by their actions, they were calling on the Lord. So can you go back to that moment that you would say, that's, that's what I've been, you know, if anybody asked me, when did you get saved? I would have went right here. And when you go right there, did you understand what we talked about this morning? I was a sinner. There was a price that had to be paid. Jesus did it for me. And I wanted what he was offering. So I called out to God and asked to be saved. Now if you did that, praise God, I rejoice with you in your salvation. If you are sitting there thinking, I don't know if that's what I did or not. I was young, I can't really remember. I was, it was kind of a confusing time. I'm not sure that's what I did. Well, Scott, I can go back and remember, and there's some details that tell me, no, that's not exactly what I did. I, I wasn't, I, that's, I, my understanding was different than what you just explained to us from the Bible. That's not what I did. Well, Brother Scott, I'm just not sure. I, I'm just flat out not sure. Please. Don't go another second in that confusion. Why be unsure? Why be confused? Why say I don't know for sure when you could know for sure? These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you might know that you have eternal life. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5. You can know it for sure. If you don't know it for sure, why not say, I'm, I don't want that time back there to be a confusion to me. I want to make a mark in the sand right now and say, yes. I'm going to do what the Bible says I have to do to be saved. And I can march forward from here and say, yeah, I'm saved because I did what the Bible said I did. And it is possible also that some here today would say, Brother Scott, you keep saying, go back to that time, go back to that time, but there's never been a time. I've never done that. And that's okay too. Because today could be your time. Today could be the moment where you say, hey, somebody explain to me exactly what the Bible says about being saved. And I understood it. And I decided to respond to it. And I pray with all my heart that you will do that to me. Now, 